been talking about spiritual gifts on Wednesday night. This is actually lesson four, and the Lord put it on my heart, heart to share about this because we're living in a really crazy, unusual time, and it feels like it's just going to get more crazy and unusual. The darkness seems to really be encroaching on all of us. We all feel the, the pressure. People feel the pressure. And, uh, and it's a tremendous time to minister life. How many believe that? Some people receive, will receive, others will re- reject. The same sun, listen, that, that melts wax hardens clay. So you got to be aware that as you minister life to people, some people get angry when things get worse. Other people turn to the Lord and they're looking for answers and they humble themselves. And, you know, that's why we just need to pray, God, make me a blessing. Don't, don't be, uh, you know, don't be surprised if some people get angry and caustic if you mention the Lord. Other people are quite yielding and ready. And how many know prayer makes the difference? So, so my encouragement is, is pray for the people that you know that don't know the Lord. Have a list of people that you pray for in your families, your friends, your work, uh, co-workers, et cetera. And then let's just ask God to use us every day to minister life to others. And again, just be aware, you know, we're to... Um, we're to reprove, rebuke, exhort. I mean, you know, uh, it's it's all together. And sometimes you'll you, you need. Sometimes you may find yourself saying something that's lovingly challenging. Another time you f- may find yourself saying something to someone um, that that really ministers. You know, just imparts uh, care, comfort, hope. And you'll find that the Holy Spirit will lead you to do whatever that person needs. How many hear me? So, so I'm just trying to emphasize that. It's a, a really unusual time and people respond in a different way. So don't get surprised if people don't receive what you have to say. Is that, is that okay? And that's where the, thank God for rain. Thank you, Lord. Bring it on. Water our trees for us, Lord. So don't be surprised, you know, again, but it is really a great time for the gifts of the Spirit to manifest. God uh, has placed this on my heart several months ago to speak again on gifts of the Spirit on Wednesday nights. I've spoken on this subject a number of times. In fact, the truth is I studied the base foundation. Of course, added a lot to it over the years. Back in 1985, we had a Sunday school in a large church that I was on staff uh, at in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And in 1985, I actually taught a course on gifts of the Spirit. So some of the fundamental things here uh, got way back then. Of course, added a lot over the years and years and years. But uh, nonetheless, I want to talk about spiritual gifts. Um, I want to encourage you in your prayer life. And that's something I've been doing for a long time. I, I just wonder how many believers today pray and ask God for gifts of the Spirit to manifest. Now, ask yourself this question. When's the last time in your prayer life you said, God, I ask you to open up the gifts of the Spirit. May the Holy Spirit manifest himself worldwide. It is time to pray that now. How many hear me? Don't wait to pray it. Do it now because the Lord really wants to manifest himself in the body of Christ. I'm very conscious of that. Again, let me, you know, to go back through a tiny bit of this. uh, 1970s when I came to the Lord, there was a tremendous moving of the Holy Spirit. And a lot of people, my young age, I was 18 at the time, a lot of people came to the Lord and we were just strung out on drugs and it was just a messy time. Just came out of the sexual revolution of the 60s that now we're reaping the consequences of in the 21st century. It's a very sad thing to see. Well, I was in the seedbed of all that and I'll tell you, there was such a move of the Holy Spirit during that time and God ministered life and you know, people, denominational people being baptized with the Holy Spirit. I was Southern Baptist and uh, got baptized with the Holy Spirit. It absolutely revolutionized my life. God wants to do similar things again today. And, uh, you know, the early church, let me also say this. The early church uh, so needed the power of God because of the oppression of the time. The Roman government was quite oppressive. It wasn't a happy time. It was a challenging time. Christianity challenged every everything the uh, the government uh, stood for it during the time. Christianity challenged it, and people rose up and challenged the believers, and many of them lost their lives. In fact, all but one of the, uh, uh, of the original apostles was, uh, uh, were martyred for their faith. So, you know, it's a very challenging time, and we have people today that say we don't need spiritual gifts. Um, they are cessationists, believing that the gifts of the Spirit ceased when the last apostle died in the first century. The problem with that is there's no scripture that indicates that happened. In fact, Peter said the promises to you, to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Is that correct? And so that includes me and you. We are a far off 
from Peter's time, first century. We're the 21st century, and it feels like we're coming full circle. The very challenges that the early believers faced in the first century, we're beginning to face uh, maybe in the beginning stages now, not so much in America yet, but the seed bed has been planted and the winds of persecution are blowing. Did you hear what I'm saying? So we need to be ready for it. At the same time, as all of these things rise up, there is going to be the power of God in tremendous manifestation before Jesus comes back. And you know, our focus determines what we get in life. Did you know that? So if we focus on the darkness, we're gonna be beleaguered and depressed and upset. But if we focus on what God wants to do in people's lives, we're gonna stay encouraged and looking for God to do something big. So how many want to live on that side of the scale? That's where I want to be. So Zechariah 10.1 says this, Ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. The Lord, and now rain is a, uh, is a type and shadow of the moving of the Holy Spirit. Ask the Lord for a moving of the Holy Spirit in a time of the moving of the Holy Spirit. The Lord will make flashing clouds. He'll give them showers of rain, grass in the field for everyone. I pray that scripture, Zechariah 10, 1, on a, a pretty regular basis, almost every day in my personal prayer life, asking God that spirit, the Spirit of God would manifest himself and the Holy Spirit would manifest worldwide. Acts three nineteen. Uh, repent, therefore, be converted, that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. This is a time of repentance, and there are many that will turn to the Lord in repentance, and this is also a time that refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began began. The time of restoration of all things is actually the time of the return of Jesus. Jesus is going to right all the wrongs. And he's going he's to correct all of the injustices that make you so angry. How many hear me? If you try to do it by yourself in the flesh, you're going to get into trouble. But you know, we, uh, we, need to, uh, we need to be aware that Jesus will come back and right all these wrongs. So again, I like the part where it says times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. As the darkness increases, there seems to be a sentiment in Scripture that the power and presence of God is going to increase. And, and then uh, two more, uh, Joel 2.28, it will come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. If you look at the following verses, which I'm not going to, it talks about, it, look, it, looks, like, uh, it looks like emblems of war with smoke and fire and all this kind of stuff. It looks like it's a time of, of, uh, of, um, of just great tumult just before Jesus comes back. Jesus' second coming is a time of, of challenge and judgment uh, for the whole world. But it's a time for the glory of God to manifest on his people. The church in America is not ready for what's coming. So I'm a pastor and God's, you know, I, I, don't, I don't give you what you want to hear. I give you what I hear God saying to me. And if I do that, I know I'm doing right. And I know he's telling me to prepare personally, spiritually first, mentally, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, relationally, as well as physically. Get ready for the things to come because we are in a time of, uh, of great tumult and instability. At the same time, God is our stability in the middle of all this stuff. Is it true? And if we keep our eyes on the right thing, it's going to be a tremendous outpouring. That's what Isaiah 60 says. For behold, verse 2, darkness shall cover the earth, deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light. The Gentiles are unbelievers. The unbelievers will come to your light, and kings, even leaders, to the brightness of your rising. So in the, during this time of, of, of great change, um, uh, lifetime change, uh, epochal, epochal times, which is a, a time where everything changes completely. Uh, God's promise that he's going to pour out his spirit. I want to read this. This came to my mind again today, and I went back in my archives. I ha actually have a hard copy of a book entitled The Pioneers of Faith, uh, by Lester Sumrall. Lester Sumrall died in 1996, but in his mid twenties, um, uh, during the war, just, just at the beginning of World War II, uh, Lester Sumrall became friends with, uh, with Smith Wigglesworth in England. And he visited his house numerous times in England. Smith Wigglesworth, for those that don't know, was an English evangelist who I think died at like age 86, 87 in the late 40s and just a wonderful 
I'm trying to see what y'all are looking at. There you go. There's his picture. Um, just a wonderful man of God, Smith Wigglesworth. He had 23 people raised from the dead under his ministry, and God used him in a tremendous way in spiritual gifts. He was an illiterate plumber. His mother got saved in the Salvation Army times with William Booth and uh, was a tremendous believer, very strong believer, and she prayed him through to salvation, I want you to know. But the only book he ever read was the Bible. Um, and, uh, he, because he was illiterate, but, uh, he had a plumbing business, uh, a very successful one. Then God called him into the ministry and worldwide he preached the gospel and amazing healing miracles occurred under his ministry. So if you hear me or others refer to Smith Wigglesworth, it's because he had a tremendous impact on the world during his, his, uh, his years of living. He's called a pioneer of faith and, uh, just, uh, some people thought he was very abrupt, but the power of God moved through him and spiritual gifts manifested through him. So uh, Lester Summerall, I saw, heard Lester many times in person when Susan and I lived in Tulsa. And we talk about his relationship with uh, Smith Wigglesworth. And he mentions that in his book, Pioneers of Faith. Pioneers of Faith, he goes over many of the uh, men and women of God of yesteryear who were um, uh, really uh, fundamental in, in bringing the moving of the Holy Spirit back into the world in the 20th century. And now we're heirs of that in the 21st century. But he's got a quote here. Uh, the last time he saw Smith Wigglesworth, Smith Wigglesworth was 80 years of age. And this was uh, and, and in 1939. And again, Lester Summerall was in his mid-20s. And he's got an excerpt I want to read from the book because the last time Lester Summerall saw Smith Wigglesworth, Smith Wigglesworth had a vision right in front of him. And Smith Wigglesworth was a man of few words, but when he said something, you need to listen to what he said. So here's what he said. This is not in the notes or anything. Uh, so he prayed over Lester Summerall. In fact, this whole excerpt in the book is worth the whole book, I tell you. Uh, so... Um, he prayed over him, laid hands on him, and then he stopped a moment. I'm reading from the book now. Opened his eyes and said, I wish to tell you something, speaking to Lester Sumrall, the young man in front of him. And his eyes looked at Elijah's. And must, looks, his eyes looked like what Elijah's eyes must have looked like when he saw the chariots of fire coming. I said, yes, he exclaimed. I see it. I see it, I asked. What do you see? Shutting his eyes again, he said. I see the greatest revival in the history of mankind coming to planet earth. Maybe as never before. I see the dead raised. I, it's ama I'm astounded when I read this, y'all. I see every form of disease healed. I see whole hospitals emptied with no one there. Even the doctors are running down the street shouting. He told me that there would be untold numbers of unaccountable multitudes that would be saved. No man will say so many, so many, because nobody will be able to count those who come to Jesus. No disease will be able to stand before God's people. It will be a worldwide situation, not local, he said, a worldwide thrust of God's power, God's anointing upon mankind. Now, that's amazing. Uh, I had a, a cassette tape that I got when... Uh, I lived in Tulsa. It was uh, January 18th, 1979. Uh, uh, Kenneth Hagan was at uh, John Osteen, who was Joel Osteen's father's church in Houston, Texas, and he was sitting on the platform. He was to minister at his church. I was assuming it would be a Sunday morning. And Kenneth Hagan, if you knew anything about his ministry, he had, he had uh, the gifts of the Spirit would manifest. He was a prophet. Uh, God called prophet. Ephesians 5, 11, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. So he had a prophetic ministry and the gift of discerning of spirits manifest in his life. And he would be sitting there and could see in the spirit realm, uh, November 2nd, got these dates, 1985 was a Saturday. And I just come in from a meeting in, in Texas and went to his meeting. And there in the meeting, he's talking to us on prayer. And suddenly he started talking to someone right beside him. And it was Jesus' invisible manifestation to him. We didn't see it. But he started talking to this person beside him. And in the atmosphere, all I can tell you, I was sitting in the audience, about 2,000 people. The atmosphere quickened. And it's like, okay. And then he said, y'all don't, y'all don't see him? Kenneth Hagin said, y'all don't see him? We said, huh? He said, Jesus is right here beside me, invisible manifestation. I can see him just like I'm seeing you. And he kept talking to him and saying things. And then he masked his words so we wouldn't know what he's talking about some. 
And, uh, and then, so I'm just trying to share, he had a, a, a prophet's ministry, which is very unusual. If you've ever seen a real prophet, it's, cr- it's an, a, a crazy thing to see, but it, it makes you aware that spiritual things are very, very real. You hear me? So I said all that to say, uh, set, uh, January 18th, 1979, he was at, uh, Kenneth Hagin was at Joel Osteen's father's church, John. Just before he ministered, he was, he, they were the Rama singers in band. He had a singing group from his Bible school that came there with him. He said, suddenly the, uh, he said the, uh, the um, ceiling disappeared and he saw two angels and they were flying over the congregation of John Osteen's large church. And he heard them speaking to one another. And I've listened to this, I don't know how many times as a kid. I was in my early 20s when I got a hold of this uh, message that he preached. And uh, he said the two angels were looking. He said he could see them. They were looking at each other. And they were talking as they flew over the congregation. And one angel said, what will the end be? What will the end look like? And the other angel, he said, turned to him and said, well, well, I don't know. Only God knows. And then the other angel that the first angel I spoke to said, but sometimes God speaks to men. And when, he, when the angel said, but sometimes God speaks to men, Kenneth Hagin said, the word of the Lord came to him saying, there will be a mighty move of the Spirit of God just before Jesus returns. Now, I've lived my life in the shadow of some of these things. And here we are. I'm not a young man. I don't feel old, but I am older but we are right on the cusp of the manifestation of these things. You hear what I'm saying? So when I'm talking about spiritual gifts on Wednesday nights, take to heart what I'm saying and learn them. My notes are online because just because you hear me tonight, you want to absorb what I'm saying. I have taken these things that I'm sharing. I have read these things over 46 year period, hundreds of times. And I've absorbed this into my life. Um, And, I want to encourage you to do that because God wants to not just use pastors and people that preach and traveling ministers in spiritual gifts. How many know God wants to use you? He wants to use average believers. God used an average believer named Ananias to minister to the apostle Paul when he was blinded by the light of Jesus' visage. Did you hear me? So if God can use Ananias, would God use you? Do you think God could use you tomorrow to minister life to someone who is about to go to hell? Huh? Do you think God could use you in spiritual gifts? So we're going to be going over the spiritual gifts. And as we do, I want to encourage you, absorb what's being said. Go, my notes are there. You can download them and copy them if you want to. It's fine with me. But I just want you to absorb the content of what's being said. And if you learn it, God will, uh, God will um, perhaps use you uh, it, by the, you'll be used by the Holy Spirit to minister life to others by spiritual gifts. God can't use ignorant people, Lester Sumrall would often say. He can't use ignorant people when it comes to his power. And he illustrates it. And my dad, I remember my dad teaching me to shoot a shotgun. None of this, is, I ain't even got in the notes yet. My dad taught me to shoot a shotgun when I don't know, I was 11 or 12 or so. And uh, he had a big old, a big old 12 gauge shotgun. He had a double barrel. Uh, and anyway, I got a lot of story about that. But anyway, uh, he had to show me how to cock the gun. He had to show me how to put the shell in it. He had to show me how to stand because a 12-gauge shotgun will kick really hard. His did tremendously. It was a 1921 Ivor Johnson. I've got it in my possession today. And uh, so anyway, he had to teach me how to cock that thing and how to hold it where it wouldn't, you know, bruise my shoulder when I, uh, when, when I shot it. And so... Uh, people that are going to be used in, with powerful things have to be educated or they become dangerous. Do you hear what I just said? So if you don't know about spiritual gifts, you can get lifted up in pride and think that you're really somebody and you, you can fall into condemnation and spiritual, you know, whatever. You hear me? So that's why we need to know about these things, know how they man- manifest. Jesus said this, John 14, 12, Assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works I do, he will do also. Greater works than these he will do because I go unto my Father. So Jesus said, not only, not only will you do what I do, what did Jesus do? Well, he had the word of wisdom manifest. He had the word of knowledge manifest in his life. He had discerning of spirits manifest. He healed people. He raised people from the dead. Jesus said, the works I do, you will do. He ministered life to people. People 
People uh, were converted, you know, at the time under Judaism in his ministry. People came to know him in his ministry. And if, and if that happened in Jesus' ministry, can it happen through you? He said, the works I do, you will do, and greater works than these will you do because I go into the Father. Perhaps it's greater because there's more of us doing what he did and we can reach more people. Is that true? He was only one place at one time. Some people think, well, I wish I'd been on earth when Jesus was here. You didn't have then what you got now. You got the Holy Spirit living in you. You've got the word of God today. They didn't have all you have today. They just had the Torah and some of the books of the Old Testament. They didn't have the whole thing that we've got today. Do you hear me? And they didn't have the Holy Spirit living within them either. We've got it a whole lot better. And God wants to use us in tremendous ways. We've covered the baptism with the Holy Spirit. We've talked about Jesus being used by the Holy Spirit the same way that God wants to use us in spiritual gifts in the past. Now we're starting to talk about the individual gifts of the Holy Spirit. Let's read this real quickly. Tonight I want to talk about the word of wisdom. Everybody say the word of wisdom. And we'll, we'll cover it clearly. It won't take a long time. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11. There are diversities of gifts but the same Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is over spiritual gifts. There are nine of them. We'll read in just a minute. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are different diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all, all the spiritual gifts and all the ministry offices and through all of the people that they are manifest through. Then he says, verse seven, but the manifestation of the Spirit, the shining forth, the literal rendering says, the shining forth of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom, and we'll talk about it tonight, through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, uh, gifts of healings by the same Spirit. To another, working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But one in the same Spirit works all these things, all what? All these nine spiritual gifts are manifest by the Holy Spirit through whom he chooses. And that's what he says, distributing to each one, to each believer individually as he wills. So there are spiritual gifts that God will use you in. I can't say what they are. And there's nothing in scripture that says that you should say, God, use me in the gift of faith. God, use me, you know, use me in discerning of spirits. God, use me in the word of wisdom or whatever. No, we're to say, God, whatever's necessary for the moment, let the Holy Spirit, I'm open for the Holy Spirit to manifest through me. The issue uh, with spiritual gifts is pride. And you can easily fall into the trap of pride if God uses you in any significant way. And the younger you are, the more potential that the pride can enter into what you're doing. Did you hear me? And even if you're older, if you're not careful, if there's a flaw in your character and you've got an itch that needs to be scratched when God uses you, if you're not careful, you'll use the gift of God to scratch your itch. And then if that happens, you'll be judged by Jesus when you get to heaven. So that's some tough stuff, isn't it? Whew-wee. So me, I've been walking with Jesus. This is my 46th year. And y'all, it, it makes me tremble to think that I'm going to stand before Jesus and give account of how I ministered on his behalf. In the right way, that scares me. You hear me? Uh, I can't tell you what. I think about that every day. So I'm really careful if God uses me. When I was young and God used me in some of these spiritual gifts, that pride thing knocked at my door and said, look at you. And I put my, it put me on the floor and said, oh God, the devil was lifted up in pride and got kicked out of heaven. I, want, I don't want to get kicked out because of pride in my life. And I had to ask God to deal with me about pride. How many hear me? When I minister, y'all will find out the Holy Spirit. I have notes, but then the Holy Spirit kind of goes on a tangent. If there's pride in your life, I want to encourage you, ask God to deal with it. Ask him to help you break the spirit of pride off of your personality. And if you've got pride issues, it's probably, it's probably because there are insecurity issues in you. The more prideful a person is, the more insecure their personality tends to be. Is that true? And then pride goes before destruction. So don't know why I'm saying that, but I'm just saying with these spiritual gifts, they're powerful gifts. And sometimes I've gone away from God using me in various ways and, um, 
and say, God, that's amazing that you would use somebody like me. But then you think back to the Old Testament. that He used a donkey to talk to a prophet. So don't get so lifted up because he could use your cat or dog if he needed to. Is that true? It's three classifications of spiritual gifts. Uh, the gifts that reveal something, the revelation gifts, and we'll talk about the word of wisdom tonight. There's also the word of knowledge we talked about last time. Then discerning or seeing in, into the realm of spirits, discerning of spirits, power gifts, the gifts that do something, three of them, the gift of faith, working of miracles, gifts of healings. And then there are the utterance gifts or gifts that say something, the gift of prophecy, which according to 1 Corinthians 14, all of us should covet earnestly to prophesy, yes or no? So I give you permission. It's a little bit different Sunday mornings. We have a much larger crowd. It's much more difficult uh, for people in the congregation to speak out a prophetic utterance. But on Wednesday nights, you have my permission. The Holy Spirit comes on you and you feel the urge to prophesy, let it go. Speak it out. Is that okay? Uh, church services years ago, that was fluid and regular. And now people, most churches won't let anything happen won't let anything happen uh, because it says let everything uh, be done decently in order and they forgot that everything and it's all decent and in order void of the Holy Ghost. That went over, that, that went over real big. Anyway, utterance gifts, gifts that say something, gift of prophecy, discerning of spirit, I'm sorry, different kinds of tongues, interpretation of tongues. Last time we talked about the word of knowledge. The word of knowledge is a supernatural uh, giving by the Holy Spirit of facts from the uh, from man, God to man about play, people, places, or things. It's past or present. I want you to say this. The word of knowledge is about things past or present. Now, now see, the word of wisdom, however, is different. Anytime God uh, gives you a word of wisdom, it's never about something that has existed or is existing. It's always about something in the future. And that differentiates the word of knowledge from the word of wisdom. Ever since I've been saved, 1976, I didn't even know what it was to start. I had no idea. I would just know things. And I didn't even know how I knew them. I can stand right now, and when this gift is in manifestation, I can go to any person and just be aware of something. And I don't even know how I know it. Having said that, if that gift's not in manifestation, I'm as ignorant as a, as a cow about people you know you just don't know what you don't know but when that gifts in manifestation you just know does that make sense and it's a fragment of god's knowing just a little small measure so the word of knowledge then the word of wisdom the word of wisdom is the supernatural giving to people by the holy spirit the divine purpose in the mind of god concerning future events now my note says this the word of wisdom is not only expressed in foretelling future events watch this but also in the commands and the instructions which god gives to us that rises out of those future events so again what word of wisdom is not it's not natural wisdom wisdom by definition is the ability to use the knowledge that you have well you can get a head full of knowledge and be as, as ignorant as a horse. You can have a lot of knowledge, but have no practical usage of it. Won't do you any good. So wisdom is the practical application of knowledge. That is not what this word of wisdom is. It's not the wisdom of man. It's the wisdom of God. It's a fragment of God's all-knowing about the future, right? So, and I mentioned when I was talking about the word of wisdom, um, I talked about God living in the eternal now. Past, present, future is all right now to God. And anything that God knows, past, present, future, and everything's now to him, he can let you know with the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, or the discerning or seeing into the realm of spirits. Those three apparatus, those three spiritual gifts are what God uses to impart supernaturally by the Holy Spirit information he has to us when we're ministering to someone you understand so so again we talked about the word of knowledge last time and went into some fair detail on that this time let me talk about uh, the word of wisdom um, these gifts manifest in different ways uh, both the word of knowledge as well as the word of wisdom uh, you can have a vision a vision many times is a very vivid dream that you have an open vision is where you have your eyes open and you can go in the book of Acts and um, there are various people who I, I think Apostle Paul had an open vision. P 
Peter had an open vision. Uh, you can have an open vision where your eyes are open, and, and you just, there it is right in front of you. Or you can have a closed vision where your eyes are shut. And that often happens when you're, when you're asleep, and it seems like a very vivid, uh, multicolored dream that you never forget. It could be a vision. And uh, so if it's a word of knowledge, it's something that is existing, or it could be the word of wisdom, something that's going to happen. So the word of wisdom can be manifested by angelic visitation. Some people have had angels visit. Remember that Joseph had an angel visit him in his dream uh, several times uh, just before Jesus was born, after Jesus was born, as Herod was seeking to kill the the, uh, Christ child, an angel appeared you know, a couple of times to Joseph in a dream, uh, Joseph, uh, uh, the angel appeared to John the Baptist's father in a dream. Remember that? Actually, there was an angel in the, in the uh, temple that appeared to him as well. Remember that? So again, angels that can come by angelic visitation. The word of wisdom can come by the audible voice of God. You know, the audible voice of God, I don't know that I've ever heard the audible voice of God. If, if you heard that, you'd know it. And let me just say, anything that God can do, the devil wants to mimic. So that's why you got to test what God gives you. Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good, 1 Thessalonians 5. And let me break in and say, you know, spiritual things are a little bit nebulous to us. So it's a challenge to really, you know, get into the guts of moving with the Holy Spirit and understanding how he speaks to you. It honestly, it's, it's a bit of hit and miss to start with. That's why I say keep a journal. If you think God's doing something with you, write it down and then test it. Does that make sense? If you feel like you heard the audible voice of God or write down your experience and don't tell anybody yet. Or if you felt like God's speaking to you in a certain that way, write it down and see if what he said happens. See if it lines up with Scripture. Does that make sense? God will never tell you anything that lifts, that lifts you up or lifts a human organization up. Did you hear what I'm saying? Now, we've got a lot of... No, I'm getting into something. We've got a lot of false prophecy today. Now, how can you tell the difference? Revelation 19 True prophecy only lifts up Jesus. Did you hear me? And if it, doesn't, if it doesn't lift up Jesus, it's not from the Holy Ghost. Prophecy is not going to lift up a nation. It's not going to lift up an individual. It's not going to lift up a ministry. It's not going to lift up an organization. It's going to lift up Jesus. And when God uses people to prophesy... That prophecy to revolve around spiritual things and the kingdom of God. Now, y'all, there's a lot of stuff out there on YouTube today. And there's a whole heap of stuff on Facebook. And I look at some of this stuff I'm hearing, I'm saying, why is that person saying that? And then if they say it and it doesn't happen, who told them to say that? You hear me? So I'm really careful with this stuff, and uh, you need to be today. There's a lot of faults around. So again, I'm just saying when the Holy Spirit manifests, you, you've got to figure out how he ministers and what he's saying, uh, and you've got to figure out how he talks to you. And so that's why I say keep a journal, and then keep it to yourself. Or ask a, a spiritual advisor, maybe a very trusted, mature friend that you know, uh, or somebody that is seasoned in spiritual things. But I, if I were you, I wouldn't be blabbing what God said to me to everybody if you're not sure it's the Lord. And we got a lot of that going on today. How many hear me? So let's get back to the subject. I'll be done fairly quickly. I don't think I'm going to read all the scripture because uh, time tends not to be on my side with some of these things. But the word of wisdom is manifest all throughout both Old and New Testaments. Uh, God gave Noah, for instance, instructions about the coming flood. See, God spoke to Noah and said a flood is coming and it had never rained. And there was dry land. And God told Noah to make a boat. So God said to Noah, Genesis 6, I'll read a few of them. 13, God said to Noah, I've decided to destroy all living creatures for they fill the earth with violence. Yes, I will wipe them 
all out along with the earth. Build a large boat of cypress wood, waterproof it with tar inside out, then construct deck stalls throughout its interior. Make the boat 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. Feet high. Leave an 18-inch opening below the roof all the way around the boat. Put the door on the side and build three decks inside the boat, lower, middle, and upper. Look, I'm about to cover the earth with a flood that will destroy every living thing that breathes. Everything on earth will die. <laughs> What would you do if God said that to you? I'd freak out. Whew, that'll stoke your prayer life, wouldn't it? But I will confirm my covenant with you. So enter the boat. Well, you and your wife, your sons, their wives, bring a pair of every kind of animals, male, female, into the boat with you and keep them alive during the flood. Pairs of every kind of bird, every kind of animal, every kind of small animal that scurries along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. And be sure to take on board enough food for your family and for all the animals. So Noah did everything exactly as God commanded him. That is the word of wisdom. See, it's not just what he said, but the instructions on how to bring it to pass. Does that make sense? Uh, there's, there's so much of this in the Old Testament and New Testament. Here's an angel telling Lot about impending destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis 19, 12. This is the word of wisdom. Then the men said to Lot, have you anyone else here? Son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, whomever you have in the city, take them out of this place. Here's the word of wisdom. For we will destroy this place. It came through an angel. Because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it, that is, Sodom and Gomorrah. So again, that was the word of wisdom because God gave them instructions about the future. God told Moses what he would do to Pharaoh when the uh, Israelites were delivered from Egyptian bondage. Exodus 6, then the Lord said to Moses, you'll see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand, he will let them go. And with a strong hand, he will drive them out of his land. That looked impossible. And as they got into the 10 plagues, it looked like it wasn't gonna happen, but God had already spoken to Moses a word of wisdom. So he knew what was going to happen before it happened and it kept him motivated to keep going when he was denied again and again. Does that make sense? God spoke to Moses and said to him, I'm the Lord. Verse three, I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. God, I'm God Almighty, but by the name of the Lord, I'm known to them. I've established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage in which they were strangers. And I've heard the groanings of the children of Israel whom the Egyptians kept in bondage. And I've remembered my covenant. Therefore say to the children of Israel, I'm the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. See, that's ringing in Moses' ears as he went through the 10 plagues. And, and Pharaoh said, you ain't going anywhere. You're going to stay here, you rascals. He said, he said, I know I heard God. He thought, I know I heard God. We're going to be free. Therefore, say to the children of Israel, I'll bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm with great judgments. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and I will give it to you as a heritage. I'm the Lord. Isn't that awesome? That's a word of wisdom. It's about the future. Ananias, New Testament, was sent to minister to Saul. Now, this is both the word of knowledge combined with the word of wisdom. And often these gifts will work together, mingle together. Now, there was a certain disciple, uh, Acts 9, 10, at Damascus named Ananias. And to him, the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, I'm here, Lord. The Lord said to him, Arise, go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Car Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. See, that's the word of knowledge. He told him about something that was existing, a person that was existing, and what he was doing. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hands on him so that he might receive his sight. Uh, Saul had, had actually gotten, had a vision from the Lord and saw this happening. And uh, Ananias had a word of knowledge that told him what had already happened. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard many uh, from many about this man, how much harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go for he's the chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. That's a word of wisdom. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. See, anything that has to do with the future is the word of wisdom. And that gift is very powerful and needs to be uh, handled very cautiously and carefully. And I'll talk a little bit more about that part of it in just a second. Agabus, here's another one, Acts 11. He told the church about a future drought in Acts 11:28. Then one of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit 
that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. Uh, This they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So what Agabus saw actually came to pass, but it was a word of wisdom. It was something in the future. It was a warning. Now, God's giving warnings today, and I don't have time to get into it. I'm listening. I'm hearing the warnings that people are having. A lot of people are having visions and dreams from the Lord today about some pretty challenging things that could be happening in America. I've chronicled them. I've listened to them. I've taken with the proverbial grain of salt. And I've made that part of my prayer life. Lord, prepare me for anything that people say they've heard from you via the word of wisdom that I need to pay attention to. Lord, help me understand and know and help me to get get things ready for me, our church, my family, yada, yada. Does that make sense? So again, you know, it happened in the early church. It can happen. Certainly it can happen today. Paul was warned of future danger. He got on a ship and there was gonna be a big problem. After long abstinence, Acts 27, 21, from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them, the people on the ship with him. Men, you should have listened to me and not sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. A a nor'easter had broke out and it was tearing their ship apart. And he said, now I urge you to take heart for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. He said, this ship is gonna sink. It's going to be torn apart. For there stood by me this night an angel of God to whom I belong and to whom I serve, saying, do not be afraid, Paul. Uh, You must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted you all that sail with you. That is, nobody on this ship is going to die, though it looks like you can't survive. You will not die. Now, that's an awesome word of wisdom. Would you agree? And, and it, kept, uh, it kept their sanity and kept, kept Paul's sanity during that ridiculous thing that happened. Therefore, take heart, men, for I believe, God, that it will be just as it was told me. However, we must run aground on a certain island. Now, that was a word of wisdom that God gave Paul, and it happened exactly the way that God gave it to him. And it came in the form of an angel appearing to him. Now, um, uh, he didn't say how that angel appeared. It could have been a vivid dream or it could be an, have been an open vision and he saw an angel. How many, how many know that God is real and, and the spirit realm is very real? And that's the reason the prophet's ministry, uh, the prophets are often used in the word of wisdom, word of knowledge, and then the discerning of spirits that they see in that realm because they, they, they are in the church to let us know that God is real, Jesus is real, angels are real, the devil's real. Heaven is real, God is real, and all that's available to you. The kingdom of God's available to you, right? And you're not by yourself in life. So again, when you think about the word of wisdom, think about God revealing something to you about the future, okay? And so I wanna make this comment. Anything that God shows us about anything past, present, or future, any of God's knowledge imparted to us comes under the category of one of these three spiritual gifts, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, or discerning or seeing into the realm of spirits. Does that make sense? So anytime God does something in an unusual way to reveal something to us so we can be prepared for something that's coming up, it's under one of those three spiritual gifts, word of wisdom, Word of knowledge, discerning of spirits. And I feel led to say this. You say, well, God ain't talking to me about nothing. Well, you ought to be really happy. I mean, Paul was in the middle of a big storm about to kill him. I mean, the Israelites, I mean, they've been in bondage for 400 years and the Pharaoh ain't about ready to let them go. And God spoke, is it true? And then Mary is about to have something crazy happen to her. She's gonna have a baby and she never had sex with Joseph. Isn't Joseph's, Joseph's gonna bail? Because she two-timed him. Well, he had a vision. He, an angel appeared to him. The word of wisdom came to him. Does that make sense? So if God's not speaking to you, listen, if God's not speaking to you, keep doing what you know to do. Keep yourself clean. Keep yourself p- pure. Stay in the word. A lot of the people in the Bible, they had only one or two instances of these things. Again, let me say, I've said this before, but you know, back in the 1980, when Susan and I moved to Oklahoma to go to Raymond, I mean, it was, exci- it was an exciting time. 
um, you know, there was a revival times worldwide and the Holy Spirit was moving in lots of ways in local churches and it was just a wonderful time. And, you know, we had, we had visions of sugar plums dancing in our heads, so to speak. Spiritual people going to uh, uh, spiritual Mecca. They called Tulsa spiritual Mecca because you got Oral Roberts, you got Kenneth Hagin, you got uh, several other big name ministries that were in Tulsa at the time. And uh, so, you know, people like me, I was, in my, I was 21 when I moved there. And a lot of young people moving. And, uh, you know, we just had the idea that constantly, constantly there's manifestations of the Holy Ghost. And we got there and started going to Bible school, attended a local church. We said, well, this ain't a whole lot different than living in my hometown and going to my local church. And yeah, you'd have sprinklings and manifestations of the Holy Spirit. But every day, no, no, you just, you just got to live life. You know, somebody said there's something about life. It's so daily. And what we're trying to do, we're always looking for the spectacular and we're missing God's supernatural stuff. You hear me? So, you know, do you like the spectacular? Well, sure. Uh, But, you know, I want the supernatural. I want God ministering to me, letting me know that he honors his word, answering my prayers while I live with faith, right? So just be aware that when you read these things in Scripture, you know, it's not that these people had, had things happen every single day, but they had sprinklings of manifestations at times when they needed them. So again, if you say, well, God ain't saying nothing to me, well, you want to be happy. Just do what you know to do and you'll be good. If God speaks to you, it's because something's coming up and he's trying to prepare you, right? But anyway, uh, let me give a few personal comments. Uh, word of wisdom, you know, usually uh, uh, it's for ministry, but if what he says to you has to do with ministry, then often the word of uh, uh, the gifts of the Spirit can manifest in your personal life. Gifts of the Spirit are generally for others. You understand? And I've always had that understanding. How be it for me, because I'm called of God and I'm in ministry, I will have gifts of the Spirit that sometimes affect my personal life. For instance, I was praying in the Spirit the second Tuesday of November 1993, and I was in my hometown, and I was pastoring a church for a pastor who had, you've heard the story, who had gone to uh, Leopaya, Latvia to start a church with his family uh, in, in one of the Baltic states there it's, uh, when, when communism had fallen. And I was pastoring his church for him. He's coming back in January of 94. This is November of 93. And I'm thinking, God, what do you have for, for me? Little old me, Mitch. What you got for me? Anything for me? And I was pastoring his church for him, supporting him in ministry. And that was the background of my thinking. So I went through my day, morning routine. I read my Bible. Then I'm praying. And I prayed in English. Then I prayed in the Spirit for a, probably an hour. And I, you know, I do that most every day. And, uh, and then I just, you know, um, after I prayed in the Spirit, usually I just sit there a little bit, you know, drink some water because you get dry mouth. Yeah, I was sitting there. And here's what I heard. It floated up from inside of me. Now, I think this was the word of wisdom. I heard three words. See, God knows how you think. He knows the syntax, that, the word formation. You hear what I'm saying? Um, he knows your colloquial expressions that, that would be familiar to you. And, and he knows how to say uh, as clear a thing as possible in the fewest number of words. Does that make sense? So sometimes God would just speak a phrase, and it's that big to you. So he said to me, already existing church. Where'd that come from? And that's the first time I heard it, second Tuesday of November, 1993. I don't remember the date, but I do remember it was the second Tuesday. And uh, so I wrote it down. And then I noticed that as I kept praying, that thing kept coming up, already existing church. Hmm. Hmm. What is that? And see, that was a word of wisdom about my future. And you know what God was saying? Well, I've been on staff at a church. I started a church, and I had started a church by that time in my life. And then I had been on staff a couple of times at a church. I had my own ministry traveling before, but I'd never taken over an already existing church as senior pastor, never. So when he said already existing church, I knew he was speaking to me about my next phase of ministry. That's the future. So this is the word of wisdom, right? And I didn't even try. And here's the thing. If you hear God say something, you don't have to work it out yourself. God himself will do it. You just trust him to do it. 
If you put your, if you monkey with it yourself and put your thumbprint on it, you can make a mess. So if God says something, just let it rest and let God do it. I did nothing with that six months later. I'm in the pastor's office. Uh, and he had come back from Latvia and uh, he was pastoring his church and I was his associate. And, um, and I said, well, actually he came by my office and, and you've heard the story. I said, Carl, uh, somewhere in the world there's a church. I'm the pastor. And he said, well, we love you here. Whether you're here two years, two months or 20 years, don't matter. I said, okay, thank you. And, uh, and that very day, this church, which was in existence then for 110 years, lost its pa- uh, pastor. That was 9 o'clock in the morning, 6 p.m. that night. <laughs> Pastor's gone. That's the very day I told the pastor that I'm, there's a church that needs a pastor, and I'm the dude's going to pastor it. That's the very day this church lost its pastor. Isn't that amazing? Now, I don't know about you. If you have things like ha- that happen in your life, you see, that's the supernatural hand of God, Right? So as hard as it's been for me, there's no devil in hell that could ever run me off or that could tell me I'm not in the will of God because something supernatural happened. God gave me a word of wisdom in my personal prayer life. Isn't that awesome? So he can do stuff like that to you when he needs to. Then, you know, uh, and I've uh, got to hurry to a close here. Um, nefarious, the word nefarious, you've heard me say this. See, that was, I, I look back on it, that was a word of wisdom, uh, March, um, March 12th. The, the night of March 12th into the morning of March 13th, 2020, uh, just before we found out about, um, about uh, COVID-19. Uh, I woke up that morning, and again, praying in the Spirit. And, I, I, and, and then when I finished praying in the Spirit, I cut the TV on while I was eating my eggs and grits and toast and almond milk. And, um, and I heard the word, Nefarious. When I heard COVID-19, I heard the word nefarious. It floated up. To say to me, that was a word of wisdom because God was saying to me, there is nefarious activity attached to COVID-19. Be aware. So see, what that did for me as a leader and a pastor, it helped me stay the course and not be moved by what other people did or said, and I was never afraid because I knew what it was. And now I've heard that same word used multiple times by media personalities and individuals, and you have too, right? I never used that word in my life. See, that was a word of wisdom, and it was to stabilize me during a very unstable time. So I'm just trying to get you to see the word of wisdom can work in amazing ways, and you don't even know it's manifesting unless you're thinking about it. Does that make sense? Um, so, um, and then uh, uh, the year before that, and you've heard me say this so many times, October 6th, 2019, I was right here on this chair, and here's the little table, and I'm praying in the Spirit. And, and God gave me a tongue and interpretation which basically said there's something going to be happening to America that will jolt, I'm using my words, not the exact words I've got them written down, that will jolt this nation severely. It'll affect every person in this nation. And it will be a severe challenge. And then the last sentence that came with that, see, it's a word of wisdom, and it's guided my life. That last sentence said, and this will be a catalyst. That is this big event that will affect everyone, will be a catalyst for the fulfillment of Joel 2.28, which I just read come to pass. In the last days, I'll pour out my spirit. So I know that we're real close to a major move of the Holy Ghost. Did you hear what I just said? We are real close. I'm excited. Are you excited? So as, as nasty as things look, as twisted and illogical as, as life has become, I know, I know right ahead of us, God wants to do something exceeding abundantly above. How many want it? One last thing I want to mention as I conclude quickly here about the word of wisdom is you want to be careful with the word of wisdom. Now, prophecy, everybody say prophecy. People call prophecy a word from the Lord. Somebody, will come, somebody comes up to you and says, I got a word from the Lord for you. Well, you know what they're saying? I got a prophecy for you. Uh, the simple gift of prophecy, according to 1 Corinthians 14, 3, edifies, that means builds you up, exhorts, that means calls you near, and uh, comforts, it's ministers life to you. 
So there's no revelation in the simple gift of prophecy. It just takes scripture, encourages you, lets you know you're going to be okay. God's got his love and his arms wrapped around you. You're going to be all right. Your future's bright. It's not dark. God loves you. He's not against you. It's for you. Yada, 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 right? But when it goes beyond that and somebody says, I got a word from the Lord for you. And then they tell you things that you're going to marry. Who, who, who? Who's that going to be? I wouldn't listen to that. I'd rather hear my dog bark to go outside. I'm not kidding. I wouldn't listen to that. Or the Lord said he wants you to, and I've had people say things to me, y'all, over the years. Well, I got a word from the Lord. When they say that, my, my hair bristles if I had it on the back of my neck. I get it all shaved off right now. I'm like, all right, let's hear it. I got an invisible file, file 13, right there. I say, well, spit it out. And they'll say, well, the Lord said. They'll say, okay. Now I'll let them say what they're going to say. And I say, is that it? And they say, hmm. I say, thank you. They go there. I say, thank you. I'm kind to them. Get off by myself. Lord, I ain't messing with that. Because most of it don't happen. Susan and I, I was dating Susan. Most of you have heard this story. I was dating Susan. This was uh, maybe August of 1970. Eight. We just started dating. I mean, really, really just started dating. So we're on our best behavior, of course. And so we went to a, a technical college, and I'll close with this, a uh, technical college, and there was this prophet there, and this guy was spot on. He could look at you. He would read your mail. He's like he's opening your mail for you. And I said, whoa. So all of us Bible school guys, you know, went, and Susan and I had a date that night. So I took Susan with me. And on the way, you know, you're repenting, oh, God, if there's any sin in my life, oh, God. Because God doesn't remember sin. And if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you. So you confessing all your stuff. Like, I don't want that prophet calling my name and saying my stuff out loud, you know. So you got, it really cleans up the Bible school, I want you to know. So we got there, you know, and, and uh, so he's doing his stuff. And it was a really amazing meeting. Uh, his name was, actually the guy's name was Leland Davis. He died a few years ago. When this man died, Jesus appeared where he was living in the kitchen and said, hi, Leland, let's go. And he went home to heaven. Ama- amazing. It, he lived in Raleigh, actually. So anyway, Leland Davis. And uh, it was a wonderful meeting. At the very end of the meeting, one of the local pastors, we didn't attend his church, but he pastored a church across town from ours. He came up to Susan. Now, Susan, now she's my new girlfriend. And, you know, I just started dating Susan. And she's a cute little girl, you know, just sweet as pudding, like she is now. And uh, this pastor said, ma'am, what's your name? She said, Susan. He said, I got a word from the Lord for you. Now, here it is. He had a word of wisdom, he thought. You know what he said? He said, when I look at you, I believe the Lord's telling me that he's sending you as a missionary to Pago, Pago. Her eyes got big as saucers. Pago, Pago? He said, that's what I'm hearing the Lord say. She said, thank you. And we got in the car, and she had a brand new Camaro. And I opened the door, let her in, and she let me drive her new Camaro. Yes. That's not why I married her, by the way. And we sat there, turned the engine on, you know, it's hot. And I said, Susan, you didn't tell me anything about Pago Pago. She said, I didn't know anything about Pago Pago. I said, you didn't? She said, well, no, I'd never heard that in my life. And I looked at her and I said, forget what he said. And we haven't been to Pago Pago yet. (laughs) So why did I tell you that? People will say all kinds of things. See, see, he took the, the simple gift of prophecy and turned it into personal prophecy and then, you know, he was high on what that Pat Prophet did, I'm pretty sure. You get what I'm saying? So be careful with all this stuff. The word of wisdom is amazing, but used the wrong way, it can damage a life. If you ever hear me as I'm laying hands on you, I get things from the Lord. If I ever say this, that, or the other, if it doesn't agree with you, forget it. I mean, forget it. I'm off. If I said it and it didn't, wasn't right, I'm off, right? Right? You judge anything anybody tells you. And don't let somebody that has some prophetic ministry tell you what you should be doing, et cetera, et cetera. Does that make sense? Stand up on your feet. I'm done. Wow.
Did y'all get anything out of this? 